Well, good morning, everybody. Last week, I asked you to go ahead and pick our next sermon series, and we had a real diverse vote. Many of you voted for this option, others voted for that option. It is just wonderful to see how you all got different things that you really wanted. James is the one that won, and that's what we're going to start today, a series through this incredible practical book of James. You'll notice in your bulletins that this is perhaps a little more complete of an outline than I normally get. There's discussion questions at the end. And you can use these in your personal life, but you can also use them if you want to get together with a friend and sort of have a mutual discussion. Or if you want to use them in your life group, you can certainly do that as well. Jody and I are going to see if we can put together a life group. If any of you would like to be part of a life group with me and Jody, just talk to her or to me. And uh, once we get a few names, then we'll sort of poll everybody and try to find a time and a place that would work best. And so if you'd like to be part of ours, you can. But of course, there's going to be some other new life groups that are going to be starting up as well. And that's going to be happening near in the future. And so keep those options open. I think Eric's going to be listing a, a list of uh, life groups coming on up in the future. So we really want to encourage you as we're starting to get back to health and everything to get into one of those. Well, let's talk about the book of James just a little bit. We're calling this series Faith Testing, a study of the book of James, how to enjoy life in trying times. And the book of James is built around this particular premise, and that is this. The quality of your life is dependent upon the quality of of your faith. Now, if you assume that that is correct, then you'll obviously be asking the next questions. Then how do I evaluate my faith? How do I improve my faith so that I can have the greatest abundant life possible? And that's what the book of James is all about. He takes us through this beautiful book and he shows us all these little faith tests. Taste tests where we can sort of evaluate the strength of our faith and how we can grow during those particular trials so that we can experience abundant life. Now the key verse is James chapter 1, verse 12. And we're going to keep bouncing back to this no matter where we go. Because it's a premise that all the other tests are sort of founded upon. And that's this. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. So are you ready to do some faith testing together with me? You can see the following outline. It's in your bulletins. It's also on the screen. We're going to be looking section by section how to test your faith by adversity or by wealth or by temptation or by your receptivity to Scripture, by partiality. By, by your works, by your speech, by your wisdom source, uh, by the conflict that you're involved with, by the judgmental criticism that sometimes comes out of our mouth, by our approach to planning, by the craving that we've got for wealth, by our perseverance in times of suffering, even by our physical health. Well, our first sermon in this series is this in James chapter 1. It focuses primarily on the first eight verses, and like I said before, also on verse 12. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll look at this section together. Lord, this this is exciting for us to come and do an in-depth study of such an incredibly interesting book. And there is something about this book that has captured the hearts of people through the generations It's like the book of Proverbs meets the Sermon on the Mount and is blended together into these beautiful short passages that help us love what you have to say to us and learn from them and be transformed. And so help us, Lord, as we study this book that we can really understand what you're saying and then apply it to our lives and experience this crown of joy that you want us to experience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Their trial was severe. They had been displaced from their homeland. Now they are living in far off countries, far from their treasured Palestine. They were scarred from persecution. They are now trying to get a new handle on life, but it wasn't coming easily. These 12 tribes scattered among the nations were Christians who were Jewish in their background who are now living far from Jerusalem, from Judea, from that whole country of their longing. Who were these people? Well, it could be that some of them were long-time residents of other countries. And maybe they had come to Jerusalem. Maybe on the day of Pentecost and they got saved and they would returned to their homelands. People that long ago, their ancestors had been pushed out of their country by Assyria and by Babylon, and now they're living far off places. Perhaps that's some of them. My guess is, and most scholars would say, most of them are Jews that had been living right there in Jerusalem when the big persecution hit. And when the persecution hit, they fled for their lives and they went to other lands because the persecution was so severe for Christians. And it's sort of like out of the fire and into, out of the frying pan and into the fire because because they went to these other places and they found themselves totally poverty stricken. They found themselves as outsiders and they were exploited by the people around them, especially rich people that would take advantage of these aliens in their lands. And life for them was incredibly hard. And so here's James, and he writes letters to these people, encouraging them in their faith. Encouraging them to not be knocked down by these trials and the temptations they're facing. Instead, to do something totally different. To embrace them because of what could happen in their lives through them. Yeah, they were scattered people. Scattered geographically, scattered spiritually. They were going through really, really tough times. The James that I'm talking about was most probably, high probability, of being James, the brother of Jesus. You know, there are several Jameses listed in Scripture, but only two of them are prominent enough to have written a letter like this. And, of course, there's James, the brother of John, but he was martyred very early, so I don't see how he could have written this book. And James, the brother of Jesus, he was a man that wasn't a believer until the resurrection. And then when he saw his brother, Jesus, even though Jesus was born of a virgin, and, of course, he wasn't, he saw him after the resurrection, and when he came to the point where he finally put his faith in Jesus Christ, he went absolutely wholeheartedly uh, in that direction of devotion to him. And very quickly, he found himself as the head of the church in Jerusalem. So he was right there as the senior pastor, so to speak, of that church, when all of a sudden this persecution broke out. His heart must have been absolutely broken to see so many people scattered so far. But with his pastoral heart, he still ministered to them. And he sent out this letter all over the place to them. I think it's applicable to us too, though. All of us live sort of scattered lives. We've got scattered dreams and scattered emotions and even scattered pieces of faith that don't always seem to come together. And you're going to find that all these trials that they went through, the faith testing that they endured, the same kind of things you and I deal with. He describes himself as James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that sound demeaning? Well, humble maybe, but definitely not demeaning. What a beautiful recognition of our submission to God and to our Lord Jesus Christ. The submission that every single one of us claim and hold on to, and for us, it is a glorious title. We're followers of God, and the joy is there. And he says, greetings. That's the way it comes across. Literally, the word means rejoice. But when they had seen each other in the church, they'd say, rejoice, rejoice, to such an extent that it turned into almost their first word of, say, of greeting. So rejoice, greetings. And you say, really? You want them to rejoice where they are with what they're experiencing? And the answer is absolutely yes. It's a life changer to realize that the joy in your life isn't dependent upon the state of your affairs, but on the state 
of your faith. That's going to make all the difference. And your very trials are tests that evaluate and improve your faith. So that's James chapter 1, verse 2. Let's, let's go, let, verse 1, let's go on to verse 2 and following. Consider pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. And that man shall not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all that he does. And then verse 12, Blessed is that man who perseveres under trial, because when he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Look at your own life. Are you going through any trials right now? My Aunt Ruth came to live with Jody and I and our family when she was 87 years old. She had been a single all of her life, and she was an amazing Christian that I always admired when I grew up. She lived with us for a while, and so she's almost, almost like a second mother in so many ways. And she'd been a church secretary and a secretary at a Bible college, and she spent some, much time in Lima, Peru, and then even on the outskirts of Peru, going on down and serving and helping with the translation work. And she was just an adventuresome woman. And when she came with us at age 87, her mind was clear, and she was so adorable to live with. We just absolutely loved her. But unfortunately, her health was really failing her. And one day she got out of bed and her foot caught in some of the blankets. She fell, she fractured her hip. And then she had respiratory problems. And so all of a sudden she's just experienced enormous pain along with some heart problems. And oftentimes I would watch her as she would sit on the couch and try to get a comfortable position. And the look of agony upon her face it was just terrible to even have to look at, much less imagine what she was experiencing. And you say, is that the kind of trial that James is talking about? And the answer is yes. It's that kind of trial, but many other kinds of trials. He says trials of many kinds. Basically, whatever trial that you go through could fit under this description. And you think about the friends and the people that are around you, and you realize many of them are going through different trials. Someone like Aunt Ruth might be going through a real health problem that's causing persistent, agonizing pain. Or there might be a young couple that's facing marital problems and the strife is very difficult within their family. Or there's a child at school that just sort of feels like, nobody likes me. Or a man is agonizing over his job. It's just turned so incredibly difficult and he's wondering, should I switch jobs? And at this stage of my life, can I even do that? And wondering what to do. Or there's a set of parents. They're watching their child go in a direction that is far from the ways of God. And they've tried to raise that child for the Lord. And now they're agonizing over the choices that are being made and their heart is breaking. Or there's a church worker that's overworked and underappreciated. Or a spouse that feels rejected because her husband wants to file for divorce. Or there's a family that's experiencing the crunch of heavy bills and little income. Or there's some grief-stricken people that are still dealing with the death of a loved one and they just can't seem to get past that grief. Or a man that's dealing with an addiction that he just can't seem to kick. Or a teenager that's facing persistent temptation. You name it, it fits. What's your trial? You want to make this really practical? You want it to apply to your life? Go ahead and interact with the sermon and say, Jesus, this is the trial that I'm dealing with right now. Plug it into the equation. Make it all about you. How can these people be helped through their trials? How can you be helped through your trials? Well, that is the question that James is dealing with in his book. And the solution begins in verse 2, where he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. 
Can I be a little honest with you? When I first started studying that passage, that felt a little disappointing to me. It almost felt like a Hallmark greeting card. Am I supposed to, to talk with Aunt Ruth there in the couch, suffering with pain, and say, you know, Ruth, all you got to do is view your pain with joy. Yeah, that's going to work. Uh, turn to your teenager just going through real agonizing times. And say, you know, you need to turn that smile upside down, that frown upside down. You know, it, it takes less muscles to smile than it does to frown. You think that's going to work? Or this was my dad's tactic. When he would find me grumbling and upset about something, my dad with this big booming voice would say, Cheer up, ye saints of God, there's nothing to worry about, nothing to make you feel afraid, nothing to make you doubt. It always made him feel better. It never made me feel better. And so you'd say, James, truly, is that what you're doing here? You're turning to these people, they're going through all this trial, all this tribulation, and you're saying, you know, all you got to do, folks, is just view all of this with joy. You know, it feels like an empty platitude, doesn't it? And if it wasn't inspired by the word, of, by the Spirit of God, you know, you'd find yourself doubting whether or not this is really true. At least that's the way I sort of looked at it. Then when I studied it further, I discovered, as is always the case, the problem wasn't with Scripture, it was with me. It's with my understanding, with my not understanding this passage well enough, and so I studied it deeper. Wow, when you get to the end of it, it makes tons of sense. So follow along with me as we look at the logic that is here. It is possible for you to choose to face your trials with joy. And when you look at that word consider, you'll discover this, that it means to regard something in a certain way. The root of the word means to take the lead in, in a certain way. And so he's not saying it's, uh, it's wrong to emotionally hurt during times of trial. He's not standing in opposition to verses like blessed are those who mourn or weep with those who weep or Jesus wept or the one in Hebrews that says no discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful. What he is saying is this. We can choose to be over our circumstances rather than under them. The word consider, like I said, means to take the lead. His literal directive is this. As an act of your will, take the lead in your thought life and determine that you're going to take a look at these trials, as painful as they really are. And that's still true. But view them with joy. Kent Hughes, in his great commentary on James, says, this means to take a deliberate and careful decision to experience joy even in times of trouble. What's liberating about this is you come to trials and you feel like such a pawn on a chessboard. You feel like you're being pushed around by your circumstances, but you don't have to be. As a Christian, even in the midst of trial, you can choose to view those trials with joy. All right, that has to be understand consider. But the next question I struggle with is, yeah, but why would you want to? <laughs> what sense does that make? Why would you want to look at all of these trials and all their pain and choose to view them with joy? Well, here brings us to our next point. It's possible when you recognize that trials lead to triumphs. How is that the case? Well, there's three parts to this. Number one. Adversity leads to tenacity, verse 3. Because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. As a fire is used to refine gold, so also God allows tough times to put our faith to the test. And every time we trust God, going through those times of trial, He takes our faith, which is being stretched at that time, and he exercises it, and he makes it stronger. It's like that old silly saying, a Christian is like a tea bag. He's not worth much until he's been through some hot water. Perseverance is a worthy goal. I desire the ability 
to live consistently in my mind and in my actions, no matter what circumstances come along. I want that kind of staying power, that kind of tenacity, that kind of go-the-whole-distance strength. I would like to possess the endurance to be faithful to God through this marathon race that we are called to race in. Romans 5.3 says, Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. And so, do I want perseverance? Yes! How do I get it? Well, the path to that is a rocky road. Uphill. It's called trials. Is that worth it? Is that enough? Am I willing to go through these trials just so I can get more perseverance? I mean, that's a great thing. Is it, is it worth the pain, though? Well, that's not the end of the journey. You see, adversity leads to tenacity, but tenacity leads to maturity. Verse 4. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Some of you perhaps have the King James Version, and, and you look at that word for complete, and it says perfect. You say, can God make us perfect in this life? Well, it's going to happen, and we're on our way to it. But the word actually means wholeness, maturity, completeness. God wants to round us out and make every dimension of our spiritual life mature and complete. He wants to continue to do that journey in our life. And this, I think, is worth the journey. Yeah, you see, it's a, it's a stepping stone where we go from adversity to tenacity or perseverance. And then we take that the next step. It's through that persevering that we become more whole, more like Christ, more spiritually fit, more mature. You know, years ago, I went with an with a old codger who was in his 70s, who was a billy goat, and he led a bunch of us up a mountainous trip all the way to the top of Long's Peak, a 14,000-foot uh, mountain there in Estes Park. And all the way up there, I'm just struggling along. He, of course, was just going up and down, coming back for us. He was, for him, it was nothing, but for me, it was, it was really hard. And, uh, and I whined a lot. Maybe not out loud, but inside I did. But when I got to the top, and I saw the beauty of the view that we had and realized the joy of the accomplishment. Ooh, the, the, the feeling of, of excitement that fit my heart it was absolutely wonderful. At that point, it was worth the trip. Put this together, it makes sense. Pressure develops perseverance, and perseverance produces that growth towards perfection, towards maturity. It's this perspective that makes you say, you know, I'm willing to go through all this. Uh, just talking with one of our ladies before church who goes to Cornerstone University and she's about to head into finals. And you say, oh, finals week. I love college, but kind of finals week wasn't one of my favorite weeks. <laughs> but why does she go through the rigors of a week of final exams? Because of the prospect of eventually getting a diploma. A runner runs through uh, difficult times where he gets blisters in his feet and aches in his sides, but he does that so he can pass the finish line as a victor. And by God's power, I want to persevere through afflictions with the positive excitement of knowing that the testings that they provide will make me more and more mature and more complete, more like Jesus and closer to his fellowship, and that is worth it all. You know, right now, I'm in the midst of dental problems. I've always had the worst teeth. I think it's genetic. Both my parents lost all their teeth. I brush twice a day, but I eat too much chocolate and junk. and Whatever the case is, right now I'm getting implants. I hate that. And a while back I went in and, and they drilled holes in my gums and they stuck these, screwed these things in. It hurt like the dickens. I did not enjoy that visit to the dentist at all. Even now, as I'm waiting for them to put the, the fake teeth in, I got these posts sticking on them. I was biting on them. It's, it's just a pain. How many of you enjoy going to the dentist? Raise your hand high and long. 
You do. Okay. All right, we've got two hands on it. Next thing you know, this church, I'm going to, I just asked that question. Next thing I'm going to ask you to come forward. No, I <laughs> No, I won't do that. You're safe. <laughs> but but uh, why, why go through all that? Well, it's for an ultimate goal of dental health and all the things that go with it. And so sometimes we choose to go through those times of trials because we say the end result is worth it. And we're developing more perseverance, which in turn is developing more spiritual maturity. And, uh, and that's bringing us closer to Jesus and his image. Hebrews 12, 2 says, let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning his shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's for the joy of knowing Christ better that you can go through your sufferings. So again, let's review. The choice to view trials with joy is sensible because of the perspective. The trials are needed for spiritual maturity. Is that good? I'm going to sweeten the deal here. Maturity, in turn, leads to vitality. Okay? Verse 12 puts a cherry on the top of this tremendous teaching. It shows us that the result of this journey through trials to maturity is abundant living. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Hopefully you guys are all memorized this with me so that we can all say it together by the end of the series. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Now, do we talk about crowns in Scripture in different ways? I don't think it's talking about some future eschatological crown that we're going to receive when we get to heaven and throw at the foot of Jesus Christ. No, I think it's talking about the, the crown of life, of abundant living that you can have right now. We can view trials with a joyful anticipation that knowing that testing of faith develops perseverance, which in turn results in spiritual maturity, which in turn results in this crown of abundant living. So adversity produces tenacity, and tenacity produces vitality. Isn't that incredible? Don't you want it? But there's one final hitch. Talking about faith. Sometimes when we're in the midst of our trials, we're so, so far down in, in the pit where we can hardly even see the sky up above. It's hard to see all of this. It's hard to look over the hedge and see the flowers on the other side. And there we are down there. What do you do during that time? I mean, this makes all perfect sense, but it's hard to experience. You want the wisdom to experience, but you just don't have it. Where do you get it? You get it from God. You turn to Him and you say, God, this makes sense, but you need to help me believe it. You need to help me receive it. You need to give me a wisdom beyond that which I have. And at this point, God says, turn to me, ask for the wisdom. We can do this with any form of wisdom, but in this particular case, it's talking about the wisdom to see trials from His perspective. Okay? Okay? So, God, would you give me that wisdom so that I can see these trials from your perspective? So we see this. This is all possible when you pray for God's perspective. So if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask of God who gives generously to all without finding fault. I love that little clause there. Because my faith isn't that great. And I've got all these problems. But in the midst of my plea for Wisdom, he doesn't say, well, Ron, I'd like to give you some, but uh, I've been checking out my scorecard on your life, and I just don't think you deserve it. He doesn't do that. He comes to us in our weakened, difficult situations filled with pain and misunderstandings and confusion, and without finding fault, he says, you sincerely ask me for wisdom, I'm going to give it to you. When he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Now that man should not think that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man in all that he does. Now we're going to look at that last part, but let's first of all look at the more important part, and that is this. A wise perspective of trial is obtained by confident praying. Now we're talking about a particular kind of prayer. It's natural to pray when we are hurting. 
But normally we pray things like, why me, Lord? Or God, can you get me out of this pit really, really fast? But God wants us to confidently ask him for wisdom to see these trials through his perspective. Now here's a question. Do you believe that God has got the wisdom that you need? Do you believe that? Do you believe that God wants to give you that wisdom? If you believe that, you've got enough. If you're wavering in those basic principles, then you're, you're like that wave of the sea, blown and tossed. You're being tossed around. So you don't need to have the faith of mustard seed. You just need to have enough faith to believe. God's got that wisdom, and he wants me to have it, and he'll give it if I ask. You believe that with confidence, and God is going to answer your prayers. So ask for that wisdom with that simple-minded but direct faith, and he will give it to you. J.I. Packer says this. When James says double-minded, literally, two-souled, he means more than irresolute or undecided or unable to make up his mind as various modern versions render the word. He's detecting not temperamental ditherness, as some translations imply, but unbelief. Doubting. That is, mistrusting the goodwill of the God who one trusts for for salvation, prays to and calls Father. The text shows this. Welcome trials, says James. Why? Because handling your trials produces resilience. Strains put on our faith and obedience are God's outward bound course, toughening us up for spirituality. The maturing that results leads us on to that victor's crown. So anyone under pressure should ask God for the wisdom needing to keep living right. Will God supply it? Yes! He is a generous giver. Always glad to answer this request. But the two-minded person, while professing faith in Christ as divine Savior and Lord, panics under pressure, thinks with his feelings rather than his brains, and concludes that since God evidently no longer cares for him, his prayers for wisdom cannot expect an answer. Yet God is unchanging in his love and free from any shadow of inconsistency. So don't insult him by indulging such unbelief, says James. What then is James' answer to double-mindedness that just opposes trust in God's word about the hope of salvation with mistrust of his word about his help under trials? Why single-mindedness, of course. Believing all that God says, not just some of it. Putting faith in his faithfulness about everything. Joyfully trusting his goodness at all times. And seeking to honor him by consistent holiness. That's true purity of heart, and that's the only life of faith worthy of the name. How I wonder, do we measure up? So it's so sweet to know that that's the kind of God we have. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is good? Do you believe that God loves you? Do you believe that God, in His sovereignty, has got this all under control? I know we're like on a parade on the ground, but He can see it from up above, and He directs the parade. Can you believe that? then with that confidence in his love and in his guidance and in his generosity, simply ask him for wisdom to see from his perspective, and he'll give you that wisdom. And when you see like he sees, it changes everything. You look at all your trials and you say, from God's perspective, I can see that there's a victor's crown at the end of all this. I can see, yeah, I'm going through very tough trials, and they are going to be painful, but I'm not going to walk them alone. God's going to be with me. And I can see that that adversity then leads to tenacity. And in that tenacity, well, I've got, I've got perseverance and, and I'm growing tougher, tougher faith. And I can see that as I grow through all that, I become more mature and complete like Jesus Christ. And when you've got spiritual maturity and a strong faith and a walk with God, that, of course, leads to real joy, a joyful Christian living. And so as I look at all that, then way back here I say, yeah, that's going to be a tough stretch up the mountain to Long's Peak. <laughs> but I'm excited about it because I know what's going to happen at the end. I'm not going to get wiped out during those trials. No, I know because of my belief in God that the end result of this has got a real good ending. 
And so that end makes me look at all this saying, wow, yeah, I know I'm going through a time of trial, but it's going to add good. This book has got a happy ending, and I'm excited about what God is going to do in my life. That's why you can view trials with joy. All right, let's put it together really quickly. The key to considering trials with joy is knowing that trials handled with faith result in triumph. More tenacity, more maturity, more vitality. And the key to knowing that there will be great results is confident praying. Whenever you have a hard time seeing all this, you just say, God, I'm having a hard time seeing it right now. Give me wisdom so that I can do it. So since trials test your faith and faith testing is required for spiritual maturing, and spiritual maturing is required for abundant living, then we can encounter trials with the anticipation of knowing that they are the door to real life. Uh, look at that little series of steps on the screen. It is possible for you to choose your trials with joy. This is possible when you recognize that these trials lead to triumphs. This is possible when you pray for God's wise perspective. So all of this is totally possible. How do you practice it? Turn them into action steps. Three things. Choose to face your trials with joy. Number two, recognize that trials lead to triumphs. Third, pray for God's wise perspective. Summary, God will grant a joyful perspective of trials to those who ask for your wisdom, for that wisdom in faith. We're all going to go through trials. You can go through them alone, or you're going to walk with them through God. You can go through them with dread, or you can view them with joy. Those who go with God, grow with God, and glow with joy. So go, grow, and glow. Okay? All right.